Hey everyone, welcome back to AI for Lunch. <clears throat> it's been a couple of months, almost two months since we last ran a webinar. And I thought it was high time I refreshed all of our discussions we've been having uh, over the past two months, given the number of public appearances and conferences I've been invited to. At the same time, I'm happy to report that ever since we started, a couple of uh, back in April or May, uh, the tone about generative AI has decidedly changed. So if you noticed, a lot of the earlier discussions revolved around a lot of the public and existential news about AI. And I'm very relieved and uh, encouraged that more recently, the conversation has shifted to something more practical, pragmatic. How do companies actually use this technology? How do we leverage it for better business outcomes? Which is really where you know the AI discussion should go. Obviously, the the some of the concerns still exist, and I'll address them later. So I thought of putting this webinar together as a way of catching up everyone on the ongoing discussions about AI, and especially for business owners and executives, if you're looking for a one-stop shop crash course on everything to do with AI, uh, you know, minus uh, a lot of the technical nitty-gritty which can happen later, you've come to the right place. So I'm calling this uh, episode Applications, Implications, Strategy, and Ethics, which basically summarizes pretty much everything you need to know to get a top-level view, bird's-eye view of what AI is about. But before that, just as a brief introduction, my name is Doc Ligot. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I run a company called Serolytics. Uh, I started with technology at a very young age. Uh, I was coding at the age of six. Uh, but at my professional career actually started in financial services. So I first worked for some global banks uh, like Australian New Zealand Bank, where the majority of my banking career has revolved around data. I didn't strictly work for an IT department. I was more into the user side of things like risk management, finance, marketing, operations. Uh, but obviously working in analytics, you kind of are a pseudo ID department uh, as well. So in a way, that's how I navigated my career, kind of at the intersection of business and IT. And I do a lot of translation for my for clients between the two. Uh, more recently, I've been running uh, startups. So I started a company called Serolytics, but at the same time, I was involved in the setup of a couple of, couple of other companies that are fintechs and very active in the hackathon space. We first got our start uh, with hackathons with the NASA Space Apps Challenge and the Break the Fake Challenge, which we both won in 2019. And succeedingly, we've been winning these uh, hackathons using artificial intelligence. You know, I think we're one of the only teams in the world, few teams in the world that has won NASA space apps three times in a row. So we obviously are not strangers to technology, not strangers to AI. And my own personal experience with AI over kind of 25 odd years has been more than 12 years has actually been in AI. So in a way, the talks I've been giving draw upon that experience. So these talks, uh, as I mentioned before, those who have been watching AI for lunch are really targeted both to technical and non-technical audiences. It's really for general information. I think AI should be widely known by everyone. But to this day, I think we're, you know, we're, there's still a way to go. It's still treated as a very esoteric and niche subject, certainly a hot topic. At, as of this uh, recording, but there's also a lot of alarmist and disinformation about AI, which I wanted to address. This also is kind of an 18,000 high level, uh, you know, view. Uh, and I freely inter intermix uh, material with my personal views. So just be uh, careful about that. Uh, all the materials are open source. So you're free to share all of this information to anyone you want. Uh, and I also welcome feedback on the series and prompts on future sessions. So I'm going to divide this talk into five parts. Again, I'm gonna review what generative AI is, talk about the applications of it, the kind of the top level applications that everyone's using it for, then dive into the implications from a kind of a societal perspective, and then go into the strategies. I think the strategies are the most, the most important part. Exactly what does it take to implement AI from an executive level view? And then in another episode, we can probably dive into the tech part uh, in the nitty gritty. And then close with, I guess, what is the more popular topic, which is ethics. Like everyone's worried about responsible AI, how to use it better. So we'll give you some of that too, so you know what to talk about. Okay, so let's start. Um, I think 
this is a very familiar intro to most of you. Up until November 2022, uh, if you ask anyone about AI, they would be talking about discriminative AI, which is AI that interprets data. This is the kind of AI that we've been used to dealing with for years. So we're very used to giving AI data. And if the AI is trained enough, it would be able to give you an insight or an outcome based on that data. Like if you give it a picture of a cat, if it's trained enough, it will give you uh, the likelihood that it is a cat. Or if you gave it a picture of a person pretending to be a cat, if it was smart enough, the AI would tell you, nope, that's not a cat. And this also includes the wide gamut of statistical and machine learning tools that people have been using on various applications like credit scoring, recommender systems, computer vision, facial recognition systems. These are all discriminative AI. Since the launch of ChatGPT and on the wide availability of tools like Midjourney and Stable Diffusion, which are the image generators, we have now been exposed to a new type of AI. It's called generative AI because it generates information. So it doesn't just interpret the data. It uses that to create more examples of the data it's interpreted. So for example, you gave it a picture of a cat, it can give you fake cats. Or if you prompt it with the word cat, an image generator should be able to give you a cat. And of course, we have the, the chat bot which finish sentences, answer questions. So these are AI that provide new things, which is something we're not used to, even up to now. We're not used to AI doing this. And that's why it's raised a lot of concerns and alarms about AI potentially taking over our jobs. Because for the most part, people haven't reflected how much of our jobs actually revolve around content and content creation. Even if you're not a content creator, you're creating a lot of content. You're writing emails, you're doing chats, you're doing business plans. You're, if you're in the advertising and the, in the creative fields, you're obviously creating art for commercial purposes. You're obviously creating you know, scripts uh, and videos. So pretty much a lot of the work that generative AI is doing could potentially disrupt and replace all of that work. And that's why people are concerned. At the same time, if we step back, these two types of AI, the discriminative AI and the generative AI, map quite closely to kind of how tr we traditionally view the brain. This has been kind of a long-standing uh, myth. Uh, biologically, there is no such thing as so left and right brain. But from a conceptual standpoint, you could see discriminative AI is closely linked to perception. It's there to give uh, logic and understanding which is associated with the left brain. While generative AI is closer to creativity, you know, it creates new things, it provides iterations, and that's closer to the right brain. So the, the point I'm making here is taken together, these two AI actually complement each other very well. So for the most part, when we talk about generative AI, it's probably at least one of these three things. Either it's a deep fake creator, so you can create synthetic media, or you can prompt an image generator like Midjourney with you know a, uh, a word or a phrase or a sentence and it creates images. Or of course, the ubiquitous chatbots like ChatGPT, Google Bard, Bing Chat, Hugging Chat, Perplexity Chat, uh, and it's Anthropics, Claude, Llama, Ametas Llama. So there are many, many of these chatbots already. And that's probably the more ubiquitous use of generative AI is the chatbot. I mean, to be fair, a chatbot and I'll talk about more about I'll talk more about this in a minute. These chatbot applications have existed for a long time, but for the longest time they've been uh, based on a very narrow set of conversations. Basically, you had to map out an entire conversation tree, basically predict what customers may use it for, and then have a canned response. That's not necessary with a large language model. Literally, large language model can interact with you like a human being. You can talk to it like a human being. And more importantly, you can order it like a human being. So more than that, more on that later. So before we begin, I wanted to highlight kind of a, I would say an injustice uh, that OpenAI did. When it first launched ChatGPT, it, it was touted as the Google search killer. So in other words, it was being likened to a search engine. In fact, a lot of people actually use ChatGPT like a search engine, which is a question or you know uh, a single prompt. They call it zero shot prompt, no context, ask a question. And that has obviously led in many cases to less than desirable results. So uh, a phenomenon known as hallucination is now commonly associated with large language models. And the reason for this is straightforward. 
uh, ChatGPT and chatbots are not search engines. Search engines are databases. In other words, if you provide a query to Google search, like who is Dominic Ligot, it will look for you know existing websites and uh, pages that have that exact string Dominic Ligot, and that will be ranked by relevance by Google to you. So there's an exact match, and in theory, there's a very high chance whatever you get is probably related to your search query. After all, that's the that's the power of Google search. But in a chatbot or chat GPT specifically, it's not so much a database as it is a logic engine. What do you mean by logic engine? It doesn't retrieve records in the traditional sense. It actually creates records. So instead of looking for web pages that match Dominic Ligot, what ChatGPT will do is construct a, an answer or a sentence that it thinks closely matches the answer to a question like, who is Dominic Ligot? So it's statistically probable text doesn't necessarily mean it's factual. And that's something to remember as we navigate. Obviously, the better uh, the better uses of these chatbots, which I'll show later, is prompting it with existing information like context. So instead of drawing upon its own internal knowledge only, what the chatbot is being asked to do here is interpret that big block of text and then use its logic engine capabilities to interpret that block. And I think that for me is really the key because as you'll see later when we talk about the strategies and the use cases, it literally is just that, a prompt with context and that allows the large language model to interact uh, more intelligently and with less hallucination. So if we deep dive a little bit into this, um, the underlying technology behind ChatGPT is the GPT, which is Generative Pre-trained Transformer. So it's a model that has been pre-trained with pretty much all of the information available on the internet and books and whatever data you know these uh, vendors like OpenAI can can get their hands on, which is a break for me a break in expectations because traditional AI you always expect to be doing a lot of data gathering and then training the model from scratch, while these large language models are already trained out of the box, so they can already be used even without data gathering, which is an unintuitive uh, thing. Uh, for many IT departments. Like what? I can use it without training it. However, as I said, if you are not careful, it could give you wrong responses that look statistically correct. So the answer to that is what a GPT does is just give the most likely word after a series of words. So if you look at this uh, prototypal sentence, the blank sat on the blank the blanks are opportunities for the GPT to fill in the blank. So it looks at all of the patterns it learned in the past and suggests the best likely word that falls between the and sat on the and whatever happens on sat on the. So that's why people are calling these uh, uh, you know, models statistical parrots or stochastic parrots because all they do is come up with likely words. Now that also changed when OpenAI released ChatGPT, because uh, just as a you know a, a factual reference, the GPT and the ChatGPT are two different things. You know, so the GPT does exactly what I said earlier, giving you statistically probable words, while a ChatGPT is an interface that works with the GPT. And what ChatGPT does is enable the GPT to respond like a human. This is because of a process known as RLHF or reinforcement learning through human feedback. And the fact that the chatbot, uh, the chat GPT works like a chatbot. It's not like the original GPT, which is essentially a model that can finish words and sentences. What chat GPT does is process the question you have into a prototypal input that then the GPT can finish. So it, it feels very natural. Okay, so let's jump into what are people using this stuff for? And I think the top four top level use cases are content creation, content summarization and analysis, interactive content, and of course, the wonderful world of images and, uh, and audio. So for example, ChatGPT can create content. Here's me prompting ChatGPT to come up with an outline for this presentation, you know, and more. Some people prompt ChatGPT to write entire essays, you know, entire reports. Certainly can be done. 
But again, the danger here is if you're just prompting ChatGPT blindly, you could get you know, a less than desirable result. But then just zooming on this ability of ChatGPT to come up with basically an answer, a statistically likely answer to any question, you can already think about various applications you can put on top of it. For example, uh, again, Learning Studio is another one, one of the best examples I've found. And you can think of Learning Studio as a prototype of many, many, many other apps. What Learning Studio does is it takes a prompt, like using generative AI in classrooms. And from that prompt, create many, many prompts that result in an entire full-blown learning course. So you might imagine maybe the first prompt is an outline, and then the first succeeding prompts are how to flesh out that outline. So in 90 seconds, basically the time it takes to brew a cup of coffee, according to them, you can come up with a totally new learning course with quizzes and activities and grading, etc. Of course, you have to double check if it got the subject matter right. But this is a massive game changer for, you know, speaking as a teacher myself, to all of the, I think, the manual drudgery needed to come up with all of these curricula. Summarization and analysis for me is the, more, the superior use case because not only are you asking ChatGPT for raw information, you're actually asking it to interpret existing information. So this is like my classic example, an article about the Amazon worker walkout. And then I said, okay, can, from the above text, so I copied the entire text, put it on the chatbot, please provide a summary of the following. Plot, tone, theme, setting, conflict, characters, point of view. Basically the seven elements of story. And pleasantly, surprisingly, the chatbot gives you these seven things. So you're now provided with multiple views of the same article that you would have had to do manually and skim and understand on the fly. And this is great if you think about it from a research standpoint, journalists can use this or people trying to create their own content. They want to analyze existing content, you know, across multiple dimensions and then hope to replicate that. Um, it's still one of my favorites. So chat PDF uh, is a way of ingesting, let's say, a knowledge base in a PDF file and then allowing you to interact with that knowledge base. So this very closely mimics kind of the enterprise use cases I'll talk about later, about how you can integrate a large language model with internal documents, with internal data. Chat PDF provides a good uh, you know, example. For example, I, I shared this before. I uploaded the Desiderata poem to Chat PDF, which is about, you know, a poem about, you know, hope in the middle of sadness, etc. Like basically life advice. And chat PDF allows you to now chat with Desiderata, you know, um, talk about uh, what should I do if I'm sad or how should I deal with loud and vexatious people? Because <laughs> it's one of the entries in the poem. So think about this from an enterprise standpoint. What kind of applications could you build on capability like this? Maybe HR can analyze CVs. Maybe training can help disseminate learning uh, outcomes, uh, you know, allowing students or employees to ask information directly from the policy. Uh, I, I did this demo for a business continuity plan and I asked, literally upload the BCP plan and then talk to the BCP plan and interrogate it. So, you know, it, it gives you this new way of interacting with content that's not like static and you're reading it. It's quite, even if it's static content, you can deal with it in a dynamic manner. Of course, text is not the only place. Generative AI is making an impression. Midjourney is one of the best uh, image generation tools. So I generated these two images with a single sentence, like beautiful Filipina in 19th century Gothic attire uh, or uh, battle mechs in a desert landscape. See, that exact sentence generated this info. Uh, and feeding this to another application called Runway, you're now able to cr create video out of these images. So the images are being animated naturally based on whatever patterns Runway ML has ingested. And that for me is quite mind-blowing because we're now slowly penetrating into the very essence of that, this kind of content creation and seeing that even using machine learning, deep learning, statistical tools, you can, in a way, disrupt what would otherwise be a human endeavor. So more on that later. Scribble diffusion is a different spin on the same game. I can scribble these four lines and then give a prompt called, give me a peaceful setting by a lake with a hilly horizon. And it will basically just use your art to create that art. 
Uh, Eleven Labs is one of the growing industry of voice AI providers where you can give a prompt and a voice will read it in a very lifelike manner. Or you can even record your own voice and it will attempt to capture your voice, your intonation, your accent, and deliver anything you want, which is excellent for voiceover uh, creativity, um, but it's also disrupting the income of legitimate voiceover artists. And of course, we're not precluding the, you know, the possibility that this can be misused for identity theft or disinformation. What works for voices also works for music. So Soundful is one of the providers I've seen which provide completely original music based on just several prompts. Like what's the beat? What's the mood? What's the rhythm? And it generates a totally original track and actually gives you intellectual property rights on that track, interestingly enough. So in a nutshell, the promise of generative AI is basically productivity, huge. I'll talk about this more as well when we talk enterprise. Customization, personalization, research and development, and creativity, just enhancing your creative powers. You may not be an artist, you can produce art, and that extends to even corporate functions like business planning, advertising, process improvement, you name it. All of these are opportunities for content creation and creativity, which, again, remains counterintuitive at this point. Okay, so given these applications, what are the implications? And some of you have already heard me talk about this, so, so I'm just going to reiterate it briefly. I like talking about the implications of AI in terms of two sides. There's the utopia and the dystopia, and the reality will probably be somewhere in the middle. But it's good to come up with this balanced narrative. So if you ask the news or look at the news, there's at least nine threads that are worth following regarding AI. One is obviously the job thread. People are worried about job losses, but more recent information indicates that uh, employees are actually looking forward to using AI or employees are getting uh, augmented by reskilling and all these tools. So the job displacement uh, you know, question is there, but not necessarily one-sided. Cheating in school is a big problem uh, because ChatGPT can basically replicate most school output. And the question now is how do we adapt not ban the AI, but adapt to its existence. The same way we've adapted to Wikipedia and the internet, all these technologies. We need to adapt to AI in schools. Copyright is another uh, you know, question mark. If anyone can replicate anyone's art, what about the copyright? Uh, economic monopolies. Obviously, a lot of this is dependent on the moves from Silicon Valley, these major companies. So we have to you know, figure out a way of diversifying our exposure because if any one of these companies goes down or makes a lot, you know, weird decision to block Philippine traffic, that'll be the end of our AI experience. Surveillance and disinformation uh, and discrimination is a big deal. Basically, the pervasive data gathering because you know it takes a lot of data to make these AI run. So if we're able to do a lot of data gathering, then you have an opportunity. The misaligned AI. I'll talk about this in the ethics section, but in in summary, this is how automation can go bad. If you're able to, if you are unable to give it accurate and uh, you know positive outcomes, it might start optimizing in weird ways. I'll show you an example later. Digital divide is something people talk about. Like a lot of the in, the AI applications are based on the on the internet. So if that were to go down, or if people don't have access to the internet, then they don't have access to these applications. Uh, disinformation obviously is a big deal, and climate. Uh, a little less uh, popular, but the climate impact stems from the fact that we require GPUs, graphics processing units, which are high-end, money-hungering hardware, uh, and use that to train AI. Same uh, hardware that was used to mine crypto. So just as the crypto trend is currently on its down streak, AI is on a massive uptrend, which can only mean that there will be more usage of these GPUs over time until somebody figures it out. So the point I always love making is, with the exception of these two areas, which are disinformation and climate, everything else has a positive, potentially positive outcome. So I mentioned jobs. Of course, we're worried about job displacement. What about job creation? Like before the internet, no one would ever have imagined jobs like web development, influencer, web developer, uh, digital marketer. You know, these are all new jobs that actually if you ask me, potentially offset any jobs lost in the past. Of course, there are more traditional companies who are still on paper that will never be avoided. 
but as much as possible, the jobs that people should take are related to this, uh, you know, uh, new new paradigm with AI. Instead of cheating, why don't we look at AI to compress knowledge? You know, teach students kind of the basics within an optimal amount of time. And, and let's be fair, 99% of the stuff you memorized in school probably isn't even being used in the real world by yourself or by your peers. So knowledge compression can form kind of a, kind of a middle ground where you have people who are going to be less dependent on kind of uh, manual labor and using uh, AI to come up with new courses or solve for those courses. Uh, creativity is obviously another aspect that I can't underscore enough. You know, people who have no business being artists in the past are now providing artist level quality. It's obviously imposing uh, some dissent among their ranks. People don't want to acknowledge it, but I think it's inevitable. Uh, and then finally, uh, productivity. You know, people are worried about the Terminator. Why don't we start thinking about Star Trek? How do we 1,000x the productivity? Differential privacy is about using AI to actually uh, mask data, but still allow it to be analyzed. So synthetic data can be used for analysis. Well, the actual data is really more uh, patient or consumer protection. Uh, and personalized convenience is another, which actually goes hand in hand with democratized innovation because there's no real barrier to entry to start using machine learning and, and deep learning. In fact, maybe we can tackle that in another episode. How do you really get started? Okay, so I'm with Melanie Mitchell. She's a professor at the Santa Fe Institute. When she said during the monk debates, sensationalist claims about AI deflect attention from real immediate risk and might result in blocking the potential benefits of this technology. Yeah, it's true. If the more we're worried about the Terminator, the less, you know, the less we're worried about the t Terminator, the more productive we'll be. Which now brings us to this section. What should we consider when we implement AI? So I'll start with this probably now familiar chart. It's about when should AI really come in? One of the tropes we really need to start letting go of is it's always a decision between humans versus AI. But the reality is, it's actually humans working with AI that will probably dominate if it doesn't start dominating already. Now, there are low complexity tasks. And depending on the uncertainty, a human can take that task, especially if there's no data available. But the aim should be to generate data about what you just did. Or some tasks are just so certain, even if they're simple, you really want to give it to a machine. You know, my favorite example is pressing buttons on an elevator. That that should not be a human job, but in some cases it is. And then obviously with the high complexity you know, uh, column, most people deal with this using analytics because that's your base uh, you know, uh, model. Discriminative AI also falls here. But when you get to a situation where it's both a highly complex and a highly uncertain you know, task, Generative AI should take the forefront, in, in, if you ask me. It's just more efficient. And then later, humans can then prune and, you know, uh, get over the prune and get rid of the, the inputs that don't make sense. So it's still humans and AI together. It just depends who's in front. Now, as far as, far as workforce sentiments are concerned, According to a recent Microsoft survey, about half of people are worried about job displacement, but offset by seven out of 10 would rather delegate work to AI to reduce their workload. So it's an interesting paradox. You're worried about losing your job, but more people are actually happy to give AI parts of their job that they'd rather not do, or maybe they want to do more efficiently. And that's interesting. Uh, in an MIT study, this is probably famous by now, uh, they tracked a call center over several months who used ChatGPT. And they found it as a good story. 14% more productive, improved job performance, improved customer satisfaction, reduced turnover. But the punchline is the 14% improvement is not equally distributed. It was realized more by the less skilled and uh, more, uh, uh, I guess, more basic uh, agents that allowed them to catch up quicker with their super agent counterparts. So, you know, food for thought. Then 
the emerging term is GPA, generative process automation. So you're not just combine, you're not just using traditional RPA tools, but you're combining them with the powers of machine learning or reinforcement learning to create automated agents that can do whatever you want them to do. And then uh, I haven't talked about this before, but there is a recent American Psychologic Psychological Association (APA), uh, you know, uh, article that looked at at least thirty-eight percent. This is in the states across the board are concerned about potential job displacement. And these concerns are strongly linked to mental health as we've uh, started to see. So employees who worry more about AI are also more likely to experience negative emotions. And that's an interesting perspective because um, one thing that people haven't probably looked at and solved for is just how much this technology will affect us as a society, as human beings. So it's worth looking into. Um, there's an IBM study, also recent, that looked at at least 40% of their workforce needing to reskill due to AI and automate a lot of tasks within the next three years. And there's always this disconnect between executives and employees. Executives are more about flexible work arrangements, work from home, while employees aren't necessarily driven by that alone, but they're, what they're looking for is Kind of impactful work or in or, or work that actually benefits society so this is where the ESG and CSR front can can totally uh, contribute in an article by thinking machines which is another AI company they were able to show that a large language model out of the box could do sentiment analysis so sentiment analysis is basically labeling a piece of text with a sentiment either uh, labeling it with an emotion or saying if it's positive or negative or neutral. And traditionally, you needed to ingest a lot of text data, understand their characteristics, identify an index. And basically what you're doing is predicting that index. And then eventually later on, we know, uh, know which phrases, which terms, which posts will probably not trend or probably not work. But at the same time, the interpretation of that text from a sentiment standpoint, can be done by a large language model with equal accuracy as the long form process. So something to think about. So um, although it's been widely talked about, I don't think people realize the actual benefit of prompt engineering, which is exactly as this image shows, the image on the left is code that will count the number of words in the text and return the result while on the right is the exact instruction written in exact English. And what you'll actually find is both are producing the same outcome. So that's important because on the one hand, you have a huge chunk of business users who potentially have process improvement ideas of their own, like out of the box, these employees or these directors, these managers already have an idea of how they will fix things. But we don't operate at that level. We try to acquire big mother, mothership IT solutions, which barely help the people on the ground. So one of the things that we learned, especially with AAP, is by organizing these hackathons or datathons uh, and getting a sponsored uh, you know, status from maybe uh, one of the companies, you can demonstrate that capability, you know? Now, moving from prompt engineering, I wanted to talk about some of the uh, emerging architectures for using these large language model. And the crux of this is most companies, although it's fine for public use, ChatGPT actually creates a lot of fear for companies. And the point is, if you're submitting information to the cloud or to OpenAI, not only are you giving them privileged information about your company, you could be telegraphing your moves to everyone in the industry. And that's a loss of competitive advantage. So the answer to that is obviously get your own localized model. And this is where fine tuning actually makes a difference. So you have a base LLM that was trained with uh, basically the entire internet. So it knows web, Wikipedia, books, Stack Overflow, etc. It knows how to construct a sentence. And then you use another data set, which is specific to your domain. So maybe if you're a lawyer, a copy of your cases, maybe a copy for the bar exam. And what we will do is, Re retrain 
that base large language model with the additional information in your corpus. And the idea there is to create a chatbot that can respond to specific domain inquiries, like a, a lawyer chatbot armed with case information or a medical chatbot armed with you know, medical knowledge, maybe observing patients and doctors over time. So that's the uh, one outcome. Uh, fine tuning actually has been shown to work very well, but it's very resource intensive. The other approach is known as RAG or retrieval or resource augmented data set or re resource augmented generator. So what you have is the base LLM, which was trained on everyone else. But when the user sends a query to this front end, what it does is it triggers a search first for specific domain knowledge and information within a company or within an organization, and then passes that query plus the additional information to the LLM. So this is no different from prompting an LLM with additional context. And as I explained, that becomes less prone to error and hallucinations. So at least it just gives you kind of the, you know, I wouldn't say just st state of the art, but state of the thinking about LLMs because people have been struggling with, okay, I agree ChatGPT is very, very groundbreaking, very, uh, you know, very uh, helpful. The question is, will it harm our existing customers? And there also has been a you know, evidence to that uh, to that respect. Okay, so you're now a company. You want to get into AI. How do you build it? So first, it should be a function of any use case with generative AI. If you reduce all of these benefits, you can look at three fronts. One is knowledge management, which is the ability of the uh, industry or the ability of the enterprise to use its own knowledge and bring it forward. That's actually quite hard. You know, Some of the data in a company don't even exist on the website and we can hammer the, the website as much as possible, but it doesn't actually give you the ability to search in a dynamic manner. So AI can do that. Uh, enhanced, uh, this thing on the left is actually productivity because uh, generative AI will save a lot of time with a lot of ma manual dead end work and Kudos to you guys who are using it that way. And finally, enhance creativity, where you're using generative AI to think of new scenarios, new iterations, perfect for advertising, for example, uh, but less intuitive for other companies. But again, you always have at least once a year a session to redirect the company, assuming you've already reached that level of trust with the owners, and presenting a, you know, an enhanced AI adoption map would be, would be the key. So, for example, risk management in any area, I spent the biggest chunk of my career in risk management. In any area you see here, there is material to be ingested and understood already. Maybe I should own a couple or train myself in a couple. And from that, create these use cases, which is a function of creativity, productivity, and, uh, and knowledge management. So it, basically, everything I've seen from risk management in, in, in a nutshell is either that analyzing information numerically and then coming up with some sort of credit score, but then also understanding the circumstances of these, uh, you know, these people. I also came up with this checklist. This comes from the episode on design thinking and digital transformation. You can think of AI as providing your company with positive symptoms, you know, that you are headed towards the right place. So I picked this five use cases from a previous uh, work with the IT company, but they certainly still apply here. So the first is agility in data. Most companies actually struggle to get data out of their system. So certainly an LLM can help with that. Once you've extracted the information, you should be able to understand it and ask, why is this happening? And assuming you have enough information, they might just go ahead and check the data. Uh, innovation is a third uh, aspect where usually innovation is held very tightly. Let's say in a BPO, it's held probably offshore. And everyone in Manila just executes that innovation. But if we're able to position right, and this is important, we actually have the same or equal or more capability to provide like an enterprise level you know, solution. It obviously, it can't just be me and you. So that's something to think about. Uh, application development. 
So there's a big opportunity in providing office automation tasks that seem too high, uh, you know, size restrictive, etc., or context restrictive. Now you can just give them an app. Here's an app. Do whatever you want. And then finally, the automation piece. What you really want to do is delegate to the machines what they can already do better than humans. So the lower left-hand quadrant earlier, which is low complexity and low uncertainty, and potentially the high complexity, high quadrant level, but supervised by AI. Okay, so we're now at the last part of the talk, and it's interesting how much this is still firmly, like it rolls out, you know, at the back of, you, you know this stuff at the back of your hand if you've been watching the, the past videos. So in a nutshell, the more imminent considerations in ethics have to do with AI safety, copyright, disinformation, and bias, and the whole education and labor sector. So from a safety standpoint, um, of course, some of you are not the first to hear about how a ways mishap can lead to weird things. Like at worst, you end up going in circles in your travel. Uh, even more worse is how the Israelis literally walked into a Palestinian camp following following ways. Because no one updates ways with the you know the rebel camps of the Palestinians. So that's probably a breakdown on legal and military fronts. You know. While uh, a couple was vacationing in Brazil, misspelled their destination. I think instead of Punto, they put Punta del Sol. And what happened is, instead of going to the resort, Waze redirects them and the driver, the driver was just too, too pliant and followed Waze to the letter into uh, a slum area where there was a shootout. And I think the couple... The, the man was wounded, but the woman was killed. Who thinks about people dying from waste, you know? Social media algorithms. So where I think we're now no longer strangers to the term echo chamber. Echo chamber is basically AI that's programmed to maximize engagement by providing you content that you already liked in the past or content that your network seems to match your sensibilities based on your own content. But this is the exact mechanism that leads to a lot of polarization and hate because not everyone sees the same message. So the broadcast is limited to a few. You can actually ask it to target quite specifically who should be watching this, for example. But that's the environment that created this right, extreme right versus extreme left uh, you know, uh, phenomena and disinformation trolls, etc. While in, Ro in Myanmar, the Rohingya people who was a minority, were actually subject to genocide by the P Myanmar military using Facebook. So that same advertising platform you're using to get you know, people to buy your product or follow your page was being used to basically murder people. You know, something to, sh something to think about. Other safety concerns, obviously training data can be bad or improperly gathered data or insufficiently gathered data. So in this, uh, both from the UK, you have someone like Richard uh, Lee who couldn't get a passport because the algorithm thought his eyes were closed. You know, Or Joshua Bada couldn't get a passport because the algorithm thought his lips were open or mouth was open. And the whole point here is the algorithm obviously hadn't had a chance to uh, analyze minority uh, ethnicities. And we've now created a systemically <laughs> aga, ano, discriminating, uh, a, a systemically, systemically discriminative or racist algorithm just by pure data imbalance alone. Um, of course, AI can make mistakes. Puppy or chihuahua or raisin bread or puppy or bagel. <laughs> Again, the pictures look very similar from a glance, but currently we're not we don't have uh you know machine learning that's able to distinguish these pictures from a practical standpoint. Like we know they are distinct because we know what a chihuahua looks like, but a machine can't tell the difference yet. Um this is an example of the alignment problem where a reward 
was misspecified. How did that, does that work? So there's an AI agent controlling this boat going around the racetrack. And it was given a reward clause that you get extra points for maximizing the amount of uh, uh, high score you can get. And what the agent eventually figured out was the best way to achieve this was never to finish the racetrack and just keep going around and around picking up you know, uh, bonus items. So was the goal achieved in a way, but is it was achieved in the way that number one qualified for the rules or number two, um, you know, uh, is the best use of this technology? Can't say. And this is just a game. So imagine AI in real life automating stuff, and you gave it the wrong definition of what to author or kind of an ethical decision. Hopefully, they'll figure it out. Um. If professionals have been misusing ChatGPT. So this is what I was saying about zero-shot prompting, like this famous story of a lawyer who got fined because he prompted ChatGPT the wrong way and it started inventing fake cases. You could be disbarred for that, you know. Um, there's a man who committed suicide, you know, trigger, or trigger alert, who committed suicide talking to another chatbot who convinced him that he was the real reason for all of his misfortunes guy couldn't take it um a worker a woman uh marries a virtual husband it was created by replica ai so she was already depressed to begin with sought companionship online via the chatbot and now wants to marry the chatbot uh get the images filing a lawsuit against stability ai we obviously you know have been monitoring this in the past and if you look at the kind of the the image in question, uh, it even got the Getty logo, you know? And that's actually the strongest grounds for infringement because you're not supposed to infringe on the logo of Getty, you know? Uh, on the content creation front, satire or disinformation, it's going to be harder to tell them apart. So this image on the left is Biden in Divisoria and it's liked by a lot of people but I am not in touch with anyone who's who's doing that. Uh, and then uh, this image on the right is, uh, if you count the number of fingers on that glove, they have six fingers. Obviously an AI generated image that was meant to be treated as news. In fact, we've, I've been talking personally about DeepX for a long time. It's already gotten to a level of reliability and advancement that you could theoretically deny any video evidence as potentially being a deep fake. Of course, it depends on what was being filmed. So just be wary of that as we navigate this uh, on, ongoing space about generative AI. Uh, another thing is the differing regulatory stance of companies uh, and countries, rather. So in the same week that Japan said their stuff is not going to be subject to copyright, and again, more recently, the US, I don't know if it was the US uh, Supreme Court or someone, some companies are taking a liberal stance and saying there's no such thing as copyright in AI, while the EU AI Act had specific provisions on copyright. So somebody did this analysis from Stanford about uh, which AI provider would prov uh, would have passed the, e the EU AI Act, and the, uh, the answer is no, none, none of them, you know, and most of the offenders or the least covered clauses are in the areas of copyright, risk management, and machine-generated content. More recently, we got this news from Washington Post reporting about digital sweatshops. And again, this is drawing a lot of mixed reactions uh, because it seems like a story looking to target scale AI specifically. Uh, for me, I, I choose to look at it in, from a more balanced perspective. I think this is good in a way that to say that there's demand for these services. Obviously, the way some of the workers have been treated should be subject to review. So, you know, uh, it's an ongoing piece. And obviously, the discussion should be about do we need some proactive labor, uh, you know, regulations about the sweatshops or to encourage more labor into AI but doing better work. Uh, I was happy to be a witness to the privileged speech of Congressman Mark Go Baguio He's looking to champion 1% of Filipinos in AI and a dedicated funding grant for startups related to AI. 
So that was it in a nutshell. Hopefully you got all of that information just to catch you up. Uh, of course, before we end, the, the, the customary you know, plugs. First is, ever since we started, I'm happy to report that my company, Serialytics, has already started to offer some capacity building courses. Uh, this is meant for in-house teams in corporate or public. We'll be doing a couple of public runs as well. Uh, the products are varied range. So starting from the right, I do a dedicated two-hour interactive briefing. So this is different from the one-hour free briefing. So this is a dedicated two-hour interactive briefing. It's a paid briefing that aims to catch everyone in your team or executive board up on terminology. So think about this webinar plus a few more uh, chapters to look at specifics around how AI works, what are the different types of AI, how is it being used. So that's a two-hour briefing. We also offer a three-hour hands-on online course on AI prompt engineering. So basically looking at the, the start of the prompts to a more complicated uh, structure for the prompting. We also have a one-day workshop where we extend the coverage from just not just the chatbots, but to include image generation. Usually we do this on site, uh, like we have a venue partner and we do like a live class, but we're also open to doing this in your company if you want, maybe break it into two of uh, three to four hour sessions to make it less onerous. And finally, our, our hero product is really the design thinking for with AI workshop, where we use AI and the process of design thinking to come up with new projects, new strategies, new solutions, or new startups that are highly aligned with your business users and a need. Now, overall, I'm still offering this one hour free briefing for companies. So this is just to get everyone up to speed on latest development. So a lot of that material went into this episode already. Uh, but at the same time, I use that as an opportunity to kind of prospect and see, okay, are you ready for AI? Would you like to talk more about it? As a company, we uh, Serialytics focuses more on the capacity building side, although we're not against helping companies come up with some sort of a demo or proof of concept if needed. And then when they're ready for more heavy production work, we actually have a, a wide ecosystem of clients that we can refer for that. Also, I'm sure but you know by now I'm on all social, many social media platforms. Please follow me on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube, certainly. And in the Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter side of things. In fact, this talk will be uploaded to YouTube. You're probably watching it from YouTube right now. And there will be more videos over time. So please expect that. So in a nutshell... Generative AI, Applications, Implications, Strategy, and Ethics. That This is episode 12 of AI for Lunch. Thank you very much. And yeah, hope to see you in another webinar.